Hey everyone, welcome to Invisible Walls, episode 217. Holy crap, time just keeps rambling on. Uh, right now it's maybe one of the slowest periods in the gaming industry I can remember. Um, but we do, we have actually managed to drum up enough topics for today's show. I think it should still be pretty good. Uh, we're definitely going to go back and talk about a lot of the stuff that happened at Comic-Con. Uh, we're going to do a fun little thing at the end of the show where we give each other 500 bucks to spend in Q4, and we basically share what we will spend that money on. Uh, we do have a good show, so make sure you stick around. Here to talk to you today about all the latest in gaming, Rohan Rivas. Hello. Mike Damiani. What's up, everyone? And your old pal, Marcus Beer. Hi there. <laughs> All right, so we're going to kick off the show with probably the biggest piece of news from the week, and that is when you buy Medal of Honor Warfighter, you will get into the beta for Battlefield 4. So they've essentially announced Battlefield 4 a full 18 months before we'll ever play it. They must be really desperate for pre-sales. Yeah, yeah, I'm guessing that uh, Medal of Honor pre-sales are lagging right now. Which, which is kind of surprising to me because what I saw at E3, it looks really kind of impressive. And I mean, I'm not the hugest fan of those genres anymore, but um, you know, it did. I mean, I did make the comment uh, on my Twitter feed after seeing it for the first time. It's Black Hawk Down with shiny graphics, but it does look. It looks good. I mean, uh, you know, just that whole getting, uh, you know, um, wading off the beach in Somalia with the docks, and you see all the all, uh, you know, all the madness going on. It looks like a, a nice, a different, a, a different route for the franchise. Um, I'm surprised that you know they felt that they needed to give it this additional boost, but I'm guessing with you know a new Call of Duty again this year, they feel they've got to have something to go up against. I think the game's biggest problem right now is that pretty much the nicest thing you're seeing said about it at this point is that it looks like it's almost as good as Call of Duty now, which to me isn't going to generate the sales that they're hoping for on the off year from the Battlefield franchise because, I mean, let's face it, right now EA is trying to replicate Activision's production schedule where they can put a big shooter out every single year, have two different teams working on them, each team gets two years to make a game and then they take turns releasing them. Um, obviously, it's worked for Activision, but they have that same brand year after year with two different teams working on the Call of Duty brand. Uh, now, Rohan, you're one of probably the biggest shooter players here in the office. Uh, we want to kick off the discussion by sort of talking about Battlefield 4 and what we want to see in the game. So, first of all, how, how much have you played Battlefield 3? Would you say you've spent 100 hours playing the game? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, yeah, because I play, like, when I look at Battlefields and I look at Call of Duty, like, I will... I can play them both simultaneously and feel like I'm getting a different experience out of them. Completely. You can play them both simultaneously. Well, you say wow. and jump from one to the other. Skilled. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, but like, yeah, I can play one and then jump to the other and then feel like I'm getting a really different experience. Like, what is interesting to me is how much they're going to change it because recently they released for Battlefield 3 the close quarters DLC and they're really trying right. to emulate. The quick-paced, corridor-driven experience of Call of Duty. It, are they really going to stay with their broad kind of huge set piece, you know, battlefield multiplayer experiences? Or are they going to try to condense that down so they can emulate that? The funny thing I would say about close quarters is it's actually more close quarters than Call of Duty. Oh yeah, I, 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 I mean agree. it's more tight than any map that's in Modern Warfare Three. But going back to what I want to see in Battlefield Four, I would probably say is my top. Uh, top thing I want to see different is I want to see more focus on the co-op experience. Like the all of the spec off like spec op stuff in Call of Duty is stellar. Yeah, it's really in good. In my opinion, you can tell they spend a lot of time balancing oh, yeah. and. Oh yeah, absolutely. So if they could really kind of master like, hey, let's do a two-player, really defined co-op experience, um, or maybe even let's do three-player. Like let's do a three-player. Each player has their own defined role in this experience, like, that's what I want to see. That's my top Battlefield 4 wish list. I now, think. would you want the co-op to be separate from the campaign, or Absolutely. do you want to play the campaign with nope. friends? I, just like Spec Ops, I want to see, like, completely, like, torn out experiences that are completely different. So I can play single player and get one, one pillar of experience. I can play the co-op, get another one, and then I have multiplayer. You know, so that's, that's what I want to see. 
Mike, what about you? You don't play a ton of shooters, or you don't spend a lot of time playing shooters, right? Yeah, I would say that's accurate. But I mean, I'm going to echo Rohan's sentiments. I mean, that's what gets me into playing games like Call of Duty, is I'm not drawn so much to the competitive multiplayer. It is the cooperative multiplayer. And the more that these games put an emphasis on that, the more inclined someone like me is going to be to play that. And I, w I mean, you said you want to keep it a little separate. I wouldn't mind having like this the dedicated story campaign have up to like two players, and then maybe have like a, a four to eight player like co-op thing, like working as a team going through a different set of missions and stuff like that. I do want it to stay from what you guys said about like the close quarter stuff. That sounds the complete opposite of what I want out of any shooter other than Call of Duty. Call of Duty has that nailed down. If I want that experience, I'll go play Call of Duty. Battlefield to me is like open environments, vehicles. I agree. And I want to see more of that. I really hope that's just like they were trying that with the DLC. But Battlefield 4, I want co-op. I want large environments. I want like multiple objectives that like your team's going to be tackling at the same time. That's the type of stuff I want to see. And bit, maybe some like new ways to deal with the vehicle stuff. I mean, it, it's always been, Battlefield's been kind of like known for that. Just try something new with vehicles. I'd like to see what they could do. Crazy stuff, even uh, just more objectives that rely on vehicles would be kind of cool. Because I think too many times it's a, uh, it's like, you know, guns and gear and stuff like that. And the multiplayer, like the vehicle stuff, works well. But I'd like to see it in incorporate into co-op somehow and have more, like a whole mission dedicated, like a, like a tank mission or something where you gotta like have your team escorting a tank, protecting it, like taking out mines and stuff like that. That I think that would be kind of cool. Going off of that, yeah. so it's like, say, Battlefield 4, you have a completely standalone co-op experience that now it's three players. You just mm -hmm. have three guys. One guy, his role is to drive the Jeep. You have one guy as passenger of that Jeep. Where you have to make stops and grab supplies. And then you have the third guy who's in an AC-130 providing cover that entire way. Like, completely cut out, separate from the storyline of the, of the single player. Like, that to me is awesome. That's what I want to see. Marcus. Um, OK, now where shall I start? All right, let's start, let's start with single player. The one thing I took from Battlefield 3 when I was playing the single player, it didn't feel like Battlefield. It didn't feel like this grand experience. The, yeah. you know, it, it felt, it did feel, you know, corridor shooter. I mean, yeah, you have the wide open map, but you're just funneled. Um, I would like to see a better, you know, a better, more, um, in lar you know, larger and more engaging single player experience. How about a campaign that you actually want to play? Yeah, I mean, I mean that was going to be my point. Is like to me, the campaign in Battlefield Three was completely throwaway. Like the best sing single player campaigns for these sort of things serve as training, but they've got to be enjoyable. They've got to give you a, a feeling that's right. I'm prepped and going into the multiplayer, and I'm not going to get my ass handed to me time after time. I didn't feel that with the single player in Battlefield. But the next thing I'll say about co-op, and I'm going to throw this out there, that if we're looking at an 18-month release schedule for Battlefield 4, which means it's going to be Christmas of next year, it's probably going to be on the next-gen consoles. Because we can expect, um, I think we... I will uh, fight you on that one. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna say that <laughs> I'm going to say that we will have a Microsoft console by, by next Christmas. I'm making that sort of like... Uh, assumption. I hope to God. <laughs> yeah, I hope to God too. So uh, what, I, what I'm going to say is, instead of three-player co-op and getting excited about that, what's wrong with six, eight, ten-player co-op? We have, you know, it, it's not beyond the realms of, uh, you know, possibility with the, uh, the Frostbite engine. If the tech is up to it, and we know on, on the top-end gaming PCs, you can have that. Yeah. You know. I mean, Jesus, going back to when I was at Novologic, we did joint ups with 150 players online. Right. And now we're still capped out. People get excited. It's like, oh, it's 54 players. Wait. Well, oh. I used to play Tribes on a Voodoo 2 card. Voodoo 2. Yeah, oh man. My God. That's 56K so connection, courtesy of America Online, 128 people. And I mean, that, it, and why now are we stuck with these games where it's like 16 guys or 10 guys? I mean, There's no what, reason for it. But I'd have to say, though, like the, the more players you introduce into uh, a, a multiplayer environment, if we're talking co-op, the more room there is for things to, to go wrong or to become a little um, less uh, scripted. Make and it scalable, though. I, I would counter I, that with make it scalable, I and it's like you know I'm gonna I'm gonna have a three uh, you know you want to play a three player game and you, you move the notch up to three and X Y and Z 
um, you know, uh, objectives pop in. However, I think balancing Shane, becomes the problem. Well, me and Shane want to do uh, an eight player with a bunch of other guys, and we scale it up to eight, and then all these other things start to kick in that, you know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility with regards to what Frostbite can do. It's certainly not an uh, internet connection issue anymore. I mean, it's the tech is there, and I think we are being sold a dodgy bill of goods by just getting excited by two-player co-op. I, you know, I, I see what you're saying, but I think there's something to be said about the way that Call of Duty does their spec ops experiences. Is that they're you can it, they're, it's like an arcade experience. You jump in, you can play it, you can try to beat your last time that you did with your buddy and get that third star. Like I think there's something to be said about those small kind of controllable. Uh, it's perfectly still, balanced. That's why you can it is perfectly those. designed for that amount of players. When you start scaling it becomes more and more difficult to really hone in on that experience and make it something that's fun for everybody who's playing it. But I mean, this is the thing, there are so many, you know, there are so many clans, there are so many groups, there are so many guilds, whatever you want to call them, that, that play these games. Those guys will come in and they will play the, the co-op missions as they're meant to be played on the higher levels, get the objectives and have a kick-ass time out of it. This, you can still have the smaller two or three players for you know people who are not as experienced or people who you know don't have two or three friends and just want to jump into a random server and they get the chance to talk to somebody over the headset and and, and learn about co coordination. But I just think it's it's about time we started raising the bar of our expectations to you know for, for co-op because co-op is basically you either get two players or you get four or five if you're lucky and it's horde mode. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just saying that the challenge is out there, and you know, best scenario, which I don't think will happen for at least another three or four years, is to take, take up what Mike said. Make the single player, the, give you the option to play through the single player uh, you know, with friends. That then makes the single player way more viable, way more enjoyable. So you know those are the, those are the the gameplay things. I'm not going to touch on the on the big multiplayer stuff because I know you guys will do that. Origin, Origin. Yeah. I know they're about to relaunch Origin, but they Origin still. <laughs> I remember the monkey uh, ball when Battlefield Three came out and we were capturing for it, trying to use Origin. I mean, right when it came out, and it's like that is footage we needed. We need it, and we just couldn't play it. It was like, a mess. It yeah. was a total. Well, mess. the system is, it was so screwed up. I mean, I got sent a box copy. And I, I, I talked about this last year, and this is one of the reasons I was so down on Battlefield 3. Box copy of my PC. I drop the DVD-ROM in the drive. I, I open up, I have to open up Origin, click install. It then starts to download the freaking game, yeah, even though no. I've got a DVD-ROM <laughs> in there. And, and a lot of people yeah. have that problem, so I have to basically go in and st install as administrator or whatever. But there are people who are kind of, you know, who may not be perhaps tech savvy, who are like, what the hell's going on? I have the game. Yeah, I have the <laughs> game. Right there. I have and box copy from you. Yeah. And playing it on the PC is like the definitive experience. Oh, no doubt about like, it. Like yeah. and feeling like you have to sacrifice to play it on the 360 or PS3 because that's the most accessible way to play it outside of Origin, like that is a huge problem for me. Yeah, they need to buck up Origin, especially if they're going to go with this bold statement of we are going to become a digital-only company, and uh, they really need to sort their shit out, or otherwise just make it, you know, a, a cloud-based game. So going off of that, I think for like what Battlefield is known for, the core multiplayer experience, I think that they've really got to look at their interface. You know, they've used that same kind of interface for Bad Company, Battlefield. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even Medal of Honor to some extent, they yeah. really need to redo that interface. Like, I'm talking like multiplayer chat, game lobbies, even how you select your attachments to your weapons. That all needs to be completely redone, in my opinion. And to just close, I would just say that they need to make sure that they keep the experience feeling different from Call of Duty. Because I agree with you, it, fe it feels like the campaign last year, they tried to ape Call of Duty. Um, with the close quarter stuff, they're starting to inch the multiplayer that way. They're never going to I, win I the agree. fight trying to be like the other guy. And real quick, I want to say, I will continue to play both. Yeah. I like me too. I like both. Like yeah. They give me two kind of different experiences. They need to stay yeah. that way, though, or yeah. I won't play both. Yep. Fill her up. You've had enough. All right, so obviously last weekend was Comic-Con. We did talk about the show last week, but really it was just me bitching about nerd culture. And me just <laughs> saying how excited I was to go. <laughs> we didn't really talk about the games that were at the show because obviously it was still going on and our guys were there. Well, now they're back. 
Uh, Chris Wynn is here to talk about Comic-Con. Hello. And Mike, who is here to talk about Battlefield, is here to talk about Comic-Con. And I'm going to talk about Comic Con. Marcus never no. leaves. <laughs> I, I, I don't actually live here. And I've got a little mattress on the back there. So, to me, maybe the biggest game story from Comic Con is that people finally got to check out the South Park RPG. Yeah. Um, at E3, it was one of those games where a couple people got to see it. I was an E3 judge. I never got to see it. I know when I saw like the official ballot go around and it was on there, I was like, wait a minute, it wasn't playable. Uh, then Jeff Keeley emailed me back, and he's like, no, some people did, did get to play it at E3. I don't know how that happened. Apparently, it was at some Microsoft event at night, but they didn't let people know it was going to be there. So this was really the first time everybody got to check it out. Mike, you actually played it. I actually didn't get to play it. They still you, weren't letting you play it. You saw a demo? But it was, we saw a demo of it. So how is this thing shaping up? It's one of the bigger anomalies right now in the industry, I think. Yeah, I'm surprised they're keeping so much of it under wraps, because honestly, what I saw... Uh, whether you're a South Park fan or not, looked really good, actually. Really? Um, it was running on the PS3, or I'm going to assume it was, because it looked like it was just a video reel, and they just had a PS3 oh, set really? up. <laughs> the guy who was speaking wasn't actually playing. It was just a video running. Oh, okay. But the icons matched up to the PS3 button, so it was definitely PS3 footage. But I think the most impressive thing about it is just the pr presentation shifting between battle. And anytime you shift in that game pr perspective, whatever, it's very fluid, very smooth. There's how no, does it there's work? no jankiness to it. Um, how it works is um, just for combat. It's a turn-based RPG. So you explore turn-based. You, you explore the town of. Think of Super Mario RPG. That's okay. the, like the closest thing you, I could compare it to. Um, you play in the world basically, and when you actually engage a battle, like you walk up to a person and you trigger the battle. But what it does, it goes into like a cutscene. And it's it's smooth. It doesn't like there's no cut to black or anything like that. It just kind of naturally. Well, they could have the jimmied that if you were just watching a video. Yeah, right? but I mean, it was very slick presentation at least. Yeah. And if that game is going to be like that, that's pretty good. And uh -huh. it's a South Park animation. They're not doing anything super taxing with that, so I right. don't see why not. <laughs> but basically, you have like a little like cutscene and exchange between the two characters. Then you go into a turn-based battle. You're on the left side. The enemies are on the right. You pick from a wide variety of moves and stuff like that. It's like Mario RPG in the sense that like you can do those timed hits on your attack. Like you push the attack button at the right time, you do more damage. And if you defend at the right time, you get less damage taken, but you can also do a, a parry counter. So Isn't that kind of the easy way out though? It, instead of uh, like real time to combat. Oh, versus real time combat. I mean. I w honestly, when they first announced the game, I was kind of hoping it would be real-time combat, more of like a, a giant sandbox, and yeah. you get us engage battles, take quests. Uh, I guess it, might, uh, it is an easy way out in that it might have been more difficult to preserve, if they're going to preserve the look of the show doing that, it might right. have like broken you out of that like illusion. I will say this, like the demo did a great job of convincing me that I'm playing an episode of South Park. It feels like South Park, the dialogue, the pacing, they nailed it. Is Even it funny? It was, yes. It, people were laughing during that demo, like, nonstop. Good. Like, and if they can keep that up throughout the whole game, that's amazing. The, the, I mean, you can tell that Matt and Trey, they're the ones that are writing that stuff. Do you think they, part of the problem is, is that they've created this world and these characters as flat 2D sprites, essentially? And that maybe bringing them into the 3D world wouldn't represent them the way that they wanted them to be represented. I don't think so. I mean, they, they've mm. their, their animation has improved so much from the early days, and you know, even you look at the South Park movie. I, I mean, mean, still though, like if they turn pseudo. around, it's like two frames. You see their back, and then you see their other side. Well, it's you know, it's it's pseudo uh, you know 2D for them now. But I, I I'll go back to you know you you know you're asking why perhaps they're keeping quiet about a lot of stuff, and I think Mike just hit on it. It's the writing. I think it. It's, you know, South Park Studios are notorious for keeping quiet with regards to what's in episodes. And, you know, they, they do try to keep stuff fresh. They, you know, go from script to final version in six or seven days. And I think that's what they want to maintain because, you know, they're writing the equivalent of what, um, you know, 15, 20 episodes if this is going to be a six or eight hour game. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. uh, to keep everything fresh, they're going to want a lot of stuff not to be spoiled. So I don't expect us to see many preview builds. When is the game supposed to be released? Is it this March, year? Or it's March. It's March 
fifth next year, 2013. Okay. So not yeah. too far away. Yeah. yeah. So I mean that that's why, and I'm excited for it. I, and I think it's one of those games that's going to sell simply because of the name and the fact that you've got people, you know, uh, that, who love the you know love the game uh, the, the series and make the series making the game. I mean, this is one of the problems I had with some of the Simpsons games. You know, the first couple were really quite atrocious, and then you know they finally got the writers in. But unfortunately, because it's the Simpsons, and perhaps you know they didn't get the writers in at their peak. The Simpsons game kind of suffered for it, but I think you know Matt and Trey are now at, you know they're at a level where they can bang this stuff out. They are, you know they're putting a lot of effort into it. And I, I didn't get a chance to see it unfortunately, but I did see the very you know the little set they built for it. Yeah. And uh, I mean I'm just hoping that the the devs don't screw it up. I mean this is probably the game that's going to um, really ensure that THQ are around for the next three or four years. You're right. And to, you were asking, like, I mean, if it was an easy way out, there was, just real quick, there was another game there, Family Guy game was there, and they showed it off. And I mean, that's going with that 3D look. And while what we saw of that game also looked pretty good, too, it, and they, the art style matched up with the show, and it felt like show, there was, just, there was a little bit lost, on, I think, on, that, uh, on the immersion factor. I, under, I, I, you could, I understand you could say it's an easy way out for South Park. I, I think they are intentionally doing that because they want to stay as faithful to the show as possible. I think that's going to be its key selling point, that it, if it d diverges from that at all, people are going to like find stuff to complain about. So uh, that will be a good comparison to the Family Guy game to the South Park game because they're going with the one's 2D, one's going 3D. It'll be interesting to see like how people receive each of those. And it'll be interesting yeah. to see how much Seth MacFarlane is involved with the Family Guy game. I mean, he's got so much going on now with Ted being so successful and yeah. all this other thing. I don't think perhaps the level of input from him is as much as it is with with Matt and Trey. I mean, honestly, on a you know on an enjoyment level, if it comes out and is at the same level as say Simpsons Hit and Run. Which was a brilliant take on the on the Simpsons and a bunch of. I think well, brilliant from, might be a little well, generous compared to <laughs> compared to everything else. and was a yeah. bunch of fun. Maybe I mean, I'll that. be happy with that. Yeah. But I, I, you know, I've got, I've got I've got nothing but faith in these guys. I mean, they're very talented writers, and that you know, from an RPG, it's the writers, it's the story. That's what's going to be key. Now, probably the biggest announcement from Comic Con was the new Deadpool game. Um, now, I'm not a huge comics guy. I used to like comics when I was younger. I haven't really kept up with it. Back when I was in com into comics, Deadpool was not a big character. Um, you know, being around a lot of people who love comics, I don't hear people talking about Deadpool a lot. It's somebody they really wanted a game from. Uh, so how do you guys feel about this? One thing I will say is I like that it looks like it's going to be an M-rated game. Which I feel like with a lot of these Marvel games, they just get like that nice candy gloss put over them so that they can stay in that T level. So yeah, you can't really have a, a, a Deadpool a, game is T rated. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, it's it's a bold move for Marvel. He is perhaps one of the lesser known, uh, and you know, of you know, when it comes to the wider, you know, the white the wider people. I mean, it's it seems to me that you know, there's this been the Deadpool movie has been in discussion for the longest time with Ryan Reynolds attached because he played the character in X Men Origins Wolverine. Um, I mean, basically, as long as the dev team have fun with it. I mean, Deadpool is the he, trailer's pretty funny. Yeah. They did a good job on that debut trailer. He, he's a he's a vicious assassin and totally insane. He calls insane. out Wolverine at the end. He has a mouth on him that makes me look like a shy nun. <laughs> uh, and you know, that's the thing. And uh, just like we said with South Park, it's got to capture the humor. It's got to capture the humor and the violence because, and you know, go over the top because. That's what Deadpool is. He will chop shit up and he will make the wisecracks. Don't make them repetitive. I don't want to hear the same wisecrack for the 55th time 10 minutes in. And, you know, have fun with it. You know, make it a, a, a you know, wide open space game, open world game. Go around chopping shit up, drop some cameos in. Activision are doing it, aren't they? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Spider Man, he better be in there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Wolverine, he better be in there. I mean, you know, have these these characters in there to battle. And, you know, it's fun that you are playing essentially the bad guy this time. And yeah. that's a rarity for a comic book game. Yep. I, I want this game, I want this Deadpool game to be compared to Arkham Asylum as Saints Row is to Grand Theft Auto. I, if, but I, I mean, I probably. No problem like with Aim and High? Yeah. I love Saints Row. But, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think. If it can deliver on that, where it's like there's a lot of parallels and like the combat's solid and the the world is fully realized, like I think it has the potential to be a very very good you know comic book game. Do you think like the game will sell? I think um, even if it's really good, I think it might because I'm guessing with the game you know tootling along. That means the I'm, movie's on the way. Well, we're, we're, I'm sure we're going to get a movie or a cartoon or something out of it uh, soon. Um, I think it's being done by High Moon Studios out of uh, San mm -hmm. Diego. 
and I think a lot of pressure's on them. But I think it'll be interesting to see how they do, because they're doing the Transformers game as well. See what the new Transformers game is, is like. Which is shaping up to be pretty good. Yeah, I mean that's been getting a lot, a lot of positive buzz. So you know maybe this is this is a good you know a good thing for them that they'll get Transformers out the way. They're using I think the same engine. I'm you know I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. Marvel have got their movie shit together and have been saying because obviously we you know um, I know a couple of, I know one guy in particular at Marvel uh, you know Chris Baker who's a really nice guy and he's been saying for the longest time wait and see what we're doing with the game stuff wait and see because they're trying to get their Figure act together out. to make sure everything is good. I mean you know we didn't really see an Avengers movie game. You know, we saw the Amazing well, Spider-Man game. Well, there is game. one coming, basically, but, but, but I mean, it looks like one of the worst games. That they but had. I mean, that that basically looks more like cartoon Avengers as opposed to Avengers yeah. the movie. Right. And you know, the only thing we saw was a Facebook game. Mm -hmm. So I think you know they are aware of you know th this horrible you know disaster that was Iron Man one and two and the Thor games, mm -hmm. and they want to get away from that, and that's a good thing. Now, the other probably the biggest theme, and we've already kind of talked about this, just naturally through the games that were at the show is a lot of TV shows being turned into video games. And one that kind of struck my interest is Activision announced a game for The Walking Dead. One of my favorite TV shows on TV right now. Love, love, love that series. Um, but we already have this other Walking Dead franchise, kind of the episodic thing from Telltale. That is doing very well and it's got really good reviews. Yeah, which has been doing great. But then there's the confusion. In fact, you know, they put out episode two, Telltale did, Right during Comic Con, so you have, you know, our review of episode two and a trailer for that on our site, and at the same time, there's this new Activision Walking Dead game. It's becoming very confusing, and it's an FPS. Yeah, and which uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the one thing I like about the TV show is it doesn't always resort to guns. Like they really have very little ammo. They count every bullet they have. Yeah, and if all they only use a gun as a last resort in that show. I mean, they'll try any other way to kill a zombie before they resort to using a gun. So I feel like that's a little bit of a juxtaposition against what the show kind of stands for. Also a prequel that follows, like, the two brothers. You already know what happens to the one brother. I won't spoil it. I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? Do you guys watch the TV show? Yeah. Really? I, I, I watch the TV show. I've read the books. Um, and I think, you know, honestly, I mean, I like what they've done with the TV show and how they've taken it perhaps off at a tangent, but I really love the books. Yeah. The, the books themselves are fantastic. I don't think we need a, a Walking Dead FPS. Yeah. I think if we're going to do a Walking Dead game and you're going to make it a prequel, make it an RPG. Yeah. Make it, make it, you know, or at least an action, or you know, a Grand Theft Auto open style world. Right. Let people explore. And I mean, the, the, when the the, the the TV series first came out, I actually did a, did a blog post on it on what what I wanted to see out of that open world with the zombies. And you know, you've uh, it, it's funny that uh, Last of Us looks more like a Walking Dead. Or what a Walking Dead game should look You're like right. yeah, than that. this uh, this zombie mm -hmm. shooter. I mean, I and I'm beginning to you know we're now at zombie burnout stage. Just like you know we were at World War II games burnout. We were at you know modern shoot you know modern military shooters burnout stage. I I think zombies now are a, you know if they haven't already are about to jump the shark. And I think that's the one thing that really could have taken uh, um, you know this franchise in a really cool direction. To you know that whole waking up in a hospital, not knowing what's going on, trying to find ammo, trying to find uh, you know fuel for a car, water. trying to, yeah trying to water. get somewhere, water. I mean, and you know trying to interact with other NPCs and with different characters and different personalities. So I mean, for me, The Walking Dead uh, from Telltale Games, way more interesting, way cooler than uh, another zombie FPS, and it just smacks of a cash in to be honest with you. So let's just go around the horn, which I haven't said on the show in quite a while, uh, and talk about the game that impressed you guys the most that we haven't already talked about, Chris Go. I mean, and maybe, I mean, I, w I really wanted to talk about Resident Evil because they showed three new levels there. They did. Three new demos that nobody cares about, apparently. We put up these brand new demos on the site. Like, they did hardly any views. I almost feel like people have given up on Resident Evil 6. I, th I think, well, we've had this discussion. I mean, we came out of E3 being mildly impressed by one of the segments of the demos, and the other two we could take or leave. And I think everybody, you know, I've spoken to wants Resident Evil to stop being generic action shooter number 36 and go back to survival horror. And I, th I don't know what it is about Capcom, um, but they just don't seem, they seem either ignorant of the demands of the fan base 
or just totally arrogant and unprepared to change the game and move it back to what it was. I mean, you know, when the Resident Evil movies are now more in entertaining than the game, oh, you've got a problem. I didn't go that far. Look, I didn't like the, I didn't like the, the, the last game, um, and the, the demo I saw at E3 was not, uh, you know, wasn't as much fun for me as watching Re the Resident Evil 2 movie. Here's the thing with RE5 and RE6 is that they're called RE5 and RE6. If they were a brand new franchise, it was just like called Zombie Hunter or something like that, I don't think people would be as hard on them as they are because there's this precedent that's been set before. And to your point, I mean, they could go back and make those old games. They were making a conscious decision to not make the games like those old games. And truth be told, I mean, I don't think that's the right answer. Like, having a camera angle that shows your guy and you can't see what's around the corner, like... I'm not, look, I'm not saying... I don't want to deal with that crap I'm not again. saying go back and remake Resident Evil 1 and 2, but I am, uh, you know, and I've always had issues with cameras well, already on already remade one But, I mean, you know, uh, I, I'm saying that go back to that suspense level. Go back to that, you know, the that atmosphere. feeling of helplessness and not, not knowing what's going on. And it seems to be, you know, they've got, they're almost like magpies. Ooh, shiny, shiny, shiny. Yeah. So. Well, there was one part we were watching the one demo, Mike and I, out here in, in our capture area. And there was one shot where, like, I think it was Chris was at the bottom of a stairway and he's, like, using the cover system. Some dude in a ski mask is like the top of the stairs. You're like doing the pop and shoot thing with the guy. You finally shoot the guy, he goes, oh! And then like falls down the stairs. And I'm like, this is Resident Evil? That's not Resident Evil. And it goes back to what I was saying. It's like the expectations you have for that franchise makes it very difficult to kind of accept what they're doing with it now. It'd be nice if that was still a third person shooter. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you watch any of the videos of me playing it, it's not that I don't know what I'm doing. It's that that game is literally the melee is so it's set over up the melee, it's yeah. so overpowered in that game you like, can kick zombies to death yeah. it's like they don't shoot at you half the time so why am i going to bother shooting using ammo. using ammo i'm just going to run up in like three kicks and they're dead it, it just made more sense to play that way and i i mean you can complain all uh, you want but i would think once people get their hands on that game i mean you're going to be like, wow, melee is really good in this game. I'm just yeah. going around kicking everything. So well, It looks a lot better when you're doing the melee than just firing guns anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'll say that much. So, Mike, what was the one game that you saw that uh, struck your fancy? Uh, I mean, obviously we talked about South Park. Uh, I've been kind of down on RE6 ever yeah. since we brought that out. Um, oh, what else was there? I mean, we saw a lot of the, I think maybe Borderlands 2 looked pretty good. That was the first time I'd actually seen it uh, in playable form. The uh, the enemy AI stuff is pretty insane in that game. Yeah, I mean, that game's I, gonna be huge. You just seeing that one uh, monster was it called Goliath that uh, it can like I guess level up when you fight it and it gets more aggressive and yeah, more yeah. difficult. So you go like Bloodworth was talking about that on the show. Yeah, I, I got to actually finally see that and then that I mean it looks that looks really good. Um, what else do we see there? I mean Capcom had the usual stuff. They, I guess they showed off oh. Apparently they showed off something new about Metal Gear Rising that no one saw that I really wanted to see. They showed off like the Ray battle apparently. Oh. And I mean what we played there was the same exact thing but actually they give you all the time you want to actually finish it this right. time. But the, apparently the Ray battle looked really great. Uh, we looked everywhere for that. I wanted to see more of that. And uh... What about Sega? Oh, jeez. Sega? <laughs> I don't even want to go over to Sega. <laughs> Sonic 2 <laughs> HD was, remake? That was pretty sad. That was pretty sad going into Sega. They weren't even in the convention. You had to go over to their little arcade thing, and they had two games there. <laughs> and it's been two games I've been showing off for a while. I was, actually, one real quick. Uh, the Sega, or the Sonic All-Stars racing game. Yeah. Uh, I was talking to the guys, and I, asked, I made a suggestion for a character. And if you know who uh, Sega Ta Sanchiro is, yep. And the guy is like, who is that? Oh, boy. <laughs> and I was like, and the guy playing. Well, that just shows you. Yeah, the guy playing is like, you did not just say that. Like, you worked for Sega and you didn't know yeah. that. And I was like, I don't That's know. That's the state they're in. There were a lot of games there. I just don't think there was much, like, except for that R the RE6 in South Park, there wasn't a whole lot that was new. It was like all. That's the That's biggest problem with Comic-Con. Comic -Con. It's yeah. all holdovers from E3. And it just felt like this year, like, there might have been more games. It just wasn't as ex it's just not exciting. It's as exciting once you've gone to E3, I think. Kinda, yeah. We're kind of like cheated, I think, when we go to cover Comic-Con so close after E3. But I mean, if you're part of the public, it's like a great place to go to actually play all those games. Because you do get to access to, to and, those uh, games. You don't get that at E3. Definitely. And uh, that's like the, one of the best things. If you don't, and I would say actually the lines 
aren't as bad to play games at Comic Con as they are for the panels. Panels right. a whole different story, yeah. but. I didn't. That's the other thing. I didn't get to see any of those panels. So like the. Well, new it's not like we're allowed to shoot them anyway, which is a big pile of bullshit. Yeah, I heard like Fort. They shut off new Fortnite. I well, yeah, we uh, had that on the site, and we were asked to take it down. Meanwhile, there's like hundreds of videos from shitty cell phone cameras all over YouTube. But that's the stand. That's the standard issue with Comic Con, yeah. isn't it? I mean, the panels. But it's garbage. Why would they want their game out there on cell phones when we had it awesomely shot, crisp HD, direct audio that they helped us set up? Yeah. You, yeah. Usually. I think there's only a Comic Con policy that you have to wait 24 hours to post something just because they. It makes sense. I mean, they want yeah, they want to people to actually go totally to it. Fine but with that. that, but yeah, that's, that's only yeah. 2,000 people max who can see that. You want to get it out to as many people as possible. Every single panel should be filmed, should be put up there. Every company who's uh, who has a panel set should say, "I want it filmed. I want it up on your site. We're going to put it up on our site because at the end of the day, it's either it, it's either shitty cell phone camera, dodgy pictures, or you know somebody live blogging well, and making a mistake." Truth be told, I got to the bottom of it. And it turns out one of our competitors was being a whiny little punk because they didn't shoot it, and that's why we had to take it down. But the bottom line is they go there to show these games to the fans in these panels. And nine times out of ten, they don't release anything. Obviously, the exception was The Last of Us. They put out the new cinematic where you meet that new character, Bill. But for the most part, they do these great demos. And no one ever gets to see them, except for the 300 people who got into the panel. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Marcus, what's your game that you would select from Comic-Con? Ah, screw the games. I went for Comic-Con. <laughs> I went, and actually, I mean, I passed by. I had a look at a quick look at some of the stuff. But, you know, uh, South Park, that's probably my game out of Comic-Con that I'm really kind of excited for. But I just got to say, Comic-Con was an absolute blast. I had one day. I went and bought a shitload of stuff. I wandered around with Jeremy Hoffman. We, uh, you know, we got a bunch of toys and art. And the, the vibe there was so chill. Everybody was just having such a great time. Um, I spent you know, the afternoon drinking with the Hawken crowd in the, in the Hard Rock. <laughs> nice. And then in the evening, I had the ultimate fanboy experience. I got invited to a BBC America meet and greet where I got to meet the cast of Doctor Who, <laughs> the writer Stephen Moffat. I got to meet the Doctor, Matt Smith, and Karen Gillan, who's Amy Pond, and Arthur Darville, who's Rory Smith. And that is somebody who's been watching this show since I was four years old, yeah. 37 years ago. That to me was the coolest thing, and I, was like, I tweeted the pictures this week. But I got to say, my first time at Comic Con, absolutely adore it. Next time, I'm going to get the you know the full uh, four day pass. I'm going to go down early, and I'm just going to wander. I'm not going to do the do the panels because that is just uh, insane. Insane. <laughs> but I just want to hang around, see you know, hang out, see what's going on, look at some of the amazing stuff. I did spend way too much. I money. think I would <laughs> say that that day is perfect. For Comic Con, I think the longer you stay there, the more the shine starts to wear off a little bit. Well, I think bit. I could definitely have done two days because I mean, I, I really didn't get a chance to to wander some of the vintage comic stuff right. as well. But I just had an absolute blast, and it's it's interesting. The two best convention experiences of the last year for me, and this is going through E3 and CES and GDC included, was PAX and Comic Con because everybody was so chill. Everybody was there who actually loved it, and it wasn't. It didn't feel like you know business. Thank you, sir. So times are hard. The games have run dry. So we're working for it a little bit here on Invisible Walls this week. But I think this segment may actually be better than if we had just talked about some random game. Uh, so basically what we're going to do is each one of us, we have $500 to spend during the holiday season this year. What will we spend it on? Um, now, we're, a couple rules, well, one rule at least. We are going to assume that the Wii U is going to cost $299. And I have heard through certain channels that that is likely going to be the price of the system. Uh, so we'll just set that at that price at that point, and we'll assume Wii U games will cost 60 bucks like all the others, which I'm guessing will probably be the case for most of its releases. So, Chris, if you have $500 at the holiday season, and we'll come back and check, like, at the holiday season, we'll see if our opinions have changed. We'll come back and readdress this. But for now, if you had $500 this holiday season, how would you spend it? I'd buy an iPad. An iPad? Yes, because I don't own one yet. Oh. And, I mean, there's a ton of games that are on my queue of things I need to play on the iPad. You know, right now, everyone in the comments are like, blasphemy. Yeah, yeah. You're part of the problem. So you're saying iPad, or you're talking about a tablet a, a tablet with a gaming option? I mean, obviously, because there's the Surface. And there's going to be the new, yeah, the new yeah. ones coming out. But, I mean, just in terms of just, like, right this very second, I mean, I'm kind of shooting for, like, an iPad. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of... Can you get one for 500 bucks? Well, they're you talking about a new smooth or whatever. Yeah. In, any, in any case, you okay. know. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of 
experiences. Like, I mean, I, I never did get to play um, that epic one with the swiping and the... Yeah, you don't even remember the name. I can't even it, remember see? the name <laughs> because I don't have an iPad and I don't even get to look at it. You, know? you just right. want to play Fruit Ninja, don't oh, you? Oh, yes. <laughs> Um, I mean, I also got really excited uh, from the Republic Kickstarter. Yeah. I, I saw that game, and I'm like, you know, if people are going to start making games like that, and they're very touch-based, like no controller, you're like just interacting with, you know, it, 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 you could probably also make it on the PC, but, you know. Anyway, portable, looks good. You can browse on the internet with it, but can do a lot more there's, some with I, it. there's some iPad-only games that I really want to check out. Okay. Mike, you got 500 bones. Oof. I mean, I would like to say the Wii U in a few games, but after, I, I'm still just not sold on that launch line. I'm, I don't feel there's an urgency for me to get that system. Well, things are starting to get a little funky now, because yeah. if you go back to E3, Reggie was like, this is a launch game, this is a launch game, this is a launch game, saying available on launch day. Now, some of those games are starting to waffle a little bit, like new, like Super Mario Brothers. He's starting to say, now it's a launch window game, the... and Pikmin, a launch window game. It's almost starting to look like, first party-wise, all we're going to have is Nintendo land there. Mm, I, I mean, at Comic-Con, I know that statement came out at Comic-Con, but I think someone asked them to clarify, and they said it was a mistake that Mario and Pikmin are still launch titles as of right now. Day and date. Day and date. So I, I think they were just... there. When we were there, they were, this real quick, they were always saying holiday, holiday for release for everything. So right. I think someone just thought like, oh, holiday window, that's not launch day. I, I don't know. Someone probably just misconstrued it, but it, they were made it clear that it was going to be a launch. They started saying launch game, launch game after that like quote came out. Uh, but if, it, if I were to get the Wii U, it would be the, the system. Well, no, no, no. You have to be definitive here. What are you spending your 500 bucks on? Okay, so $300 on the system. So you would get a Wii U? Yeah. It seemed like when you first started talking, you were like, you weren't going to buy one. Plus okay. tax. I'll be including tax. <laughs> Let's in say no tax. No tax. Let's say we, we're buying it on Amazon. in <laughs> Delaware. Okay, okay, I guess I'm not being <laughs> exactly definitive then. Uh, I mean, if I were going to buy it, I mean, that would be $300. I'd want the control, the classic pro controller. The, 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 I hope that's available at launch and, cause so I can play third party games. Because some of those third, like Assassin's Creed 3, if I'm getting the Wii U, I want to get it on Wii U. Hopefully, it's going to look the best and have the most functionality on there. Uh, hopefully, I mean, they said it's not coming out. I, mean, I kind of wish RE6 was coming on it to maybe play it on that. Uh, but Pikmin 3, I would that's I would pick that up more than any of the other first party titles that Nintendo has a offer. And then Zombie U, that that would that would probably wrap up about 500 of the controller, those three games, and the system. So you you would buy those and not buy anything for any other system. If you had it only could, 500 bucks to spend. There, there, could, there could be another Wii U game they haven't announced yet. Wait, another Wii U game? So you're saying you don't care about anything on the 360 or PlayStation no, I do. 3? Okay, I said it. Okay, that was... Uh, you asked me if it was definitive. If I'm, if I'm not convinced... <laughs> let, let I'm, it, still, I'm still on the fence. I'm still choices. on the I mean, fence about you know, if, Wii U. If, if, if Mike I'm really on that, the fence about Wii U. That. But here, just real quick, if I didn't... If like, okay, I'm not getting the Wii U, then it's going to be like Tomb Raider. It's going to be RE6. Tomb Raider's not out holiday. Oh, yeah, I guess that's Okay, so RE6... Borderlands 2 is this still this fall, right? Yep. Um, Borderlands 2 comes out in yeah, like a, a month. Weeks, yeah, yeah. yeah the, definitely pick that up. Uh, there's got to be other games that I'm thinking about. All the games I want, I, you say fall, are coming out in Q1 now. Uh, a lot I, of them I, have I, moved, I, I might, yeah. I might save my if I uh, if you want the honest to God answer, I would save my money. I would wait to Q1. <laughs> I'd buy the Nino Cooney Collector's Edition. It's gonna be like a hundred something dollars. <laughs> I'll buy Tales of Exilia when it probably comes out for like one hundred fifty so bucks. You'll buy a lot of gift cards, basically. <laughs> yeah, I'll do a lot of pre-orders for G for JRPGs that are coming out next year. But I mean, yeah, everything's been delayed to Q1. Like it's hard. Like you heard me say, it's like gonna Tomb be an Raider. Awesome Q1, but yeah. I mean, South Park. I want that. I want. As I said, Tomb Raider. It's it's really hard seeing all those games pushed back into Q4 or Q1 of next year. But I think honestly, the answer is going to be it's going to be the original one. It's going to be sadly probably Wii U because I'm going to want I'm going to want it, and I'm going to want probably Pikmin 3 because the more I see that, the more I play it, the more I'm kind of like sucked into that game. Mm -hmm. And I f got to try Zombie U at Comic Con, and it was like I want to play more of this game. Yeah. So if they just can throw out one more game, maybe something that hasn't been announced that they keep teasing that there's a few unannounced third-party games. Just one more, I I'll be sold if they if they could throw that out there. And I'm along with that regular controller to play some of those games. I think that will tap out at about five hundred dollars. Marcus. Uh, 
I'd probably go with collector's editions because you know I'm a sucker for the toys anyway. Yep. Assassin's Creed Three has an amazing collector's does, edition. Yeah. Uh, Borderlands, uh, that Borderlands Two, that's right up there for me. Uh, Dishonored. Bethesda always do something really cool with that. Uh -huh. um, and then the fourth one would probably be Hitman. Because I'm actually, you know, I, despite obviously the whole nuns in latex and guns. <laughs> Which people just need to get over. <laughs> debacle. Um, I, I got to say that, you know, what I've seen of Hitman, going back to E3 of last year, uh, is really exci you know, exciting for me. I want to go, go and play it. I'm getting the urge to go and really play it, play this game. And I would say those are probably the four because, again, there are games that have moved into next year, like Tomb Raider. Um, I mean, on the, you know, if I've got a couple of bucks left over, I am actually very curious to try out Sleeping Dogs because what I've seen again of it... Um, yeah, it's starting you know, to shape up pretty well. It's starting to shape up real nice. And of course, you know, there's the... There is the, this, the, the mystery in the room, and I, but I think we're now at the stage where we can all debunk it. There's no GTA V this year. I mean, it's yeah. now this late. <laughs> it's not, it's not gonna <laughs> happen. But I might plonk down some pre-order money for that for, for next year, you know, especially if they do a, uh, a collector's edition. But you know, that's it for me. And honestly, no, I wouldn't get the Wii U um, if I had to shell out for it. Um, it's just not uh, exciting for me. Um, I feel the way Nintendo is treating the media and the public and you know, with regards to the announcements and the price and the actual release date for what is a new console, I've got a funny feeling they're going to burn us. I've got a funny feeling that Japan will get it first, and you know, if we're lucky, you know, we we might get it in the U.S. and Europe might get sh uh, stiffed, or vice versa. Um, it just depends if they got the production to do it. And you know, the games, they really need to come with a stellar launch uh, launch thing because the 3DS launch uh, uh, lineup was pretty Awful. underwhelming. If and, you're being generous. You know, yeah, I mean, it's it's you know it's basically something that's just moved on the back burner, and yeah, I, I expect better of, of Nintendo, and I I rag on them because I hold uh, I used to hold them in such high regard for the way they did things and the stuff they released, especially with the Wii and if it, when it first came out and then it went downhill, and I feel now they are basically trading on a perceived. Uh, cachet of goodwill that is rapidly eroding and has been eroding from probably like the second year of the Wii. Yeah. So um, that's why I'm not going to go and buy. Uh, when, when do I get my 500 bucks? You're not getting it. This is <laughs> the fantasy. <laughs> You spent uh, it on Comic-Con stuff. Yeah, yeah. I spent more than that on Comic-Con. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> oh, yeah, but I, just wait till I show you some of the shit I got. Hopefully worth the cash. Uh, for me, Definitely buying the Wii U, no waffling at all. Um, I've bought every video game console the day it came out for as long as I can remember. Um, and this, it, to me, isn't just another video game console. It's a game console that incorporates a touch screen. Uh, even to just fiddle around with that thing, even without a game, I'm too excited to be able to pass that up. So that takes $300 out of my 500 right there. Uh, I'm definitely getting Assassin's Creed 3. Uh, and like Mike said, you know, I've seen pretty much all three versions at this point. To me, the Wii U version looks the best. It also has added functionality, so that would probably be the one game I buy with the Wii U, will be Assassin's Creed 3. Uh, there's another game that might make launch that hasn't been announced yet that maybe I would buy for it, but uh, I can't really mention that. Um, and then, as far as other games are concerned, um, RE6, I mean, I can basically only buy two more games at that point, because that's got me up to like 360. You're going to waste mm. 60 bucks on RE6. Yeah. I mean, you say waste, I think I'll still enjoy the game. I liked RE5. I don't think it was necessarily an amazing Resident Evil game, but I thought it was a great action game. Um, so I would buy RE6, and that basically leaves me with one other game, and then it depends. It's either going to be Halo 4 or Black Ops 2 one of those two games, depending on which game ends up being the better of the two. Um, because, you know, I enjoy shooters, so uh, to me, spending 60 bucks on a shooter that I'm gonna get yeah. literally hundreds and hundreds of hours out of, no-brainer for me. So I would go Wii U, Assassin's Creed 3, Resident Evil 6, and then either Halo 4 or Black Ops 2. And while we're on the subject of spending money when times are tight, I gotta say, I mean, this is the first sort of like summer where I've started participating in the Steam summer sales. And there's a bunch of good stuff. Oh, it's on amazing! There. I mean, I dropped. Dude, you can get Max Payne right now for half price. Well, I got the entire season pass for The Walking Dead. Yeah. Uh, for from Telltale, and I spent fifteen bucks. 
And I mean, I had Fallout New Vegas on the 360. Now I have it on the, the entire one with every single bit of DLC on the PC for 10 bucks. Yeah. I mean, Torchlight got, went on sale. Um, Bastion was on sale for three bucks a couple of days ago. And there are AAA games available for like four dollars right now on Steam. I yeah. mean, Max Payne 3 is at half price, like a month after it came out. Talk about bomba. Yeah, there's definitely some phenomenal stuff. And I got to say, you know, if you have a, a, a PC that can handle some of this stuff. Go check those guys out. And I also have got to give props to good old games for some of the stuff they're doing, yeah. especially as they have Dungeon Keeper 1 and 2 optimized now. And Dungeon Keeper 1 and 2 are the greatest games ever in the history of the world. Trademark. Nobody else has ever come anywhere good. It's from when Pete Molyneux was a good game designer and not wanking off the Fable of Journey. All right, that's going to do it for episode 217 of Invisible Walls here on GameTrailers.com. A couple things before we go. Most importantly, we just locked down our first ever panel at PAX Prime in Seattle. That's right. I think the room, I'm not going to say how many people will fit in the room. 36,000 people. Like 36, no. <laughs> But we have a panel. It's on Friday uh, of PAX at 1.30. We would love for all you guys to show up there. Uh, we don't want to spoil what we're doing there yet. Uh, it will be very fun. And we will be doing some giveaways, some stuff that you will only be able to get at our panel. So uh, everybody who's going to PAX, we would love to meet you guys. Uh, we'll be doing a big Q&A during the panel. I will say that. Uh, there will also be some time after the panel for us to meet some of you guys, which I think is awesome. Finally be able to connect with some of you guys in person. Um, we are all in at PAX this year. We actually have two panels. Uh, we have a GT Film Festival panel that will be going on Saturday afterwards, so make sure you put that on your docket too. I believe that's around 3 o'clock. So 1.30 on Friday for Invisible Walls panel, and then 3 o'clock the next day for pretty much everything else that GT does. And that room is much bigger for the general GT one. So uh, we will be there in full force. Also, one final note, the new player, I mentioned it last week on the show. It just went into the final stretches of Q&A today. In fact, about an hour before we came in here to take the show. It is almost done. So again, thank you for your patience. Thanks for bearing with us. The new player is actually going to be really awesome, I have to say. And it's guaranteed to be up before PAX. Definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if it's not, I'm resigning. <laughs> and I'm not even lying. So. And I mean, you know, you talked to me this morning that the iTunes feed is there's the next problem to tackle, RSS feed. Yep. Um, so, I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on, and this man is supposed to have sort of like a kind of chill couple of days break between Comic Con and everything else. Yeah. But, I mean, it's it, it, there's a lot of people working really hard, and I know a lot of people you, uh, you know, are really upset about it. But as an outsider looking into what these guys do, they really, they really are busting ass trying to get all these things fixed, and they will be fixed at some point before the Mayan apocalypse happens. Yeah, if it's not fixed for PAX, maybe the panel, the IW panel, was me resigning. <laughs> <laughs> I will take your place and you can be me. I, I don't think I can handle <laughs> any more messages on Twitter if it goes on until PAX. I think I, my brain might just explode. So anyway, as I said, thanks for being patient. I think the site every day is getting better. There are tons of fixes that are going online every day that you probably don't even notice or realize. Uh, but yeah, I think there's like two changes per day to the site where we basically upload a ton of changes in batches at a time. So uh, we're working on everything. We're working really hard. Some of the problems a little more hard to fix than others. Uh, thanks for sticking with us. So anyway, that's it for this week's show. Thanks for being on the show, guys. Excellent job as always. Invisible Walls is up and out.